everybody. Uh, welcome to the Dev Nation Tech Talk. Um, today we've got some very, very cool stuff uh, that we're going to talk about in terms of Keycloak uh, straight from uh, the guys that do it. Um, I'd like to introduce Shaf, uh, who is an architect or developer or something fantastic to do with Keycloak. Um, do you want to give a quick intro, Shaf? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me to do this session. And uh, yeah, my name is Shaf. Um, I've been a Java developer for, uh, for many, many years. Uh, I've worn multiple hats as a solution architect, as a consultant. So yeah, here I am uh, talking about something that I really like, which is Java and Keycloak together. Excellent. And we've also got Issa on the line, uh, who is going to help with the questions. Do you want to introduce yourself quickly, Issa? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, Jan. Uh, hi, Shaf. I'm Isa. I'm uh, currently the Red Hat Field of Key Club product manager uh, here in Red Hat. So, in charge of the product direction and uh, looking forward to assist our customer on about what they ask and what they need. Cool. Okay. So I'm really looking forward to this myself because I've been playing with Key Club for a while and uh, uh, and I'm a huge fan of Quarkus as well. So, I hope there's some good stuff I'm going to hear about. but. I'll pass it on to you now, Chef. Uh, so let me show your screen and we'll get started. Cool. Thanks. So, see, so yeah, I guess my screen is on, right? <clears throat> um, so, yeah, so we, we wanted to talk about the, uh, the Red Hat Bill of Keycloak. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, quickly showcase some of those things. I'm going to talk about them as well. Um, and then we jump into a demo. Um, in the demo, we have you know, we look at the developer experience and some of the other things that I'm, I'm really excited to show you uh, and everybody else uh, at the same time. So who am I? Quick quick introduction. I think I already gave that. Uh, I'm a Java developer. If you, if you wrote code in uh, AWT and uh, then you know my age, uh, that's pretty much what I did back in the days with Swing, with AWT, et cetera. So I've been a long time Java developer. Um, and I love to speak about technology. I'm also an InfoQ technical uh, editor for JavaQ. Um, what, I, what I love doing is uh, working with Quarkus and Keycloak, so that's what this is going to be about. Um, I'm going to go through a quick introduction, um, a little bit of technical overview for folks who might not know Keycloak. So if you don't know Keycloak, you know, this is perfect. I'm going to give you a little bit of overview as well. Obviously, I won't be able to go into the... Uh, details of the, those overviews to showcase that demo, but uh, we're going to we're gonna do something simple. Simple like create an app in Quarkus, um, uh, use it on, you know, kind of develop it on locally, and then uh, push it out uh, onto something like OpenShift. Uh, I also have Angular app that kind of works with Keycloak as well. So we're going to see how, uh, you know, these two sets of applications work together, one being a back-end service, one being a front-end service. We're going to deploy it to OpenShift, and I think that's going to take a lot of you know time from us today. So, and then we're going to get, jump into some question and answers. So hopefully, yeah, you just throw as many questions as you want. And Isa and I are here, and Ruth as well, and we try to answer as much as possible. So what is Keycloak? Keycloak is an open source identity and access management solution. Uh, it's based on the upstream Keycloak project. Um, if you haven't been on there, you know GitHub. Uh, has the upstream keycloak project it has the keycloak org website as well uh, lots of people use it whether they use it in containers zip files etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, at the moment the current keycloak version is uh, 22 for the red hat build of keycloak and i believe a uh, keycloak version for the upstream community version 23 is pretty much near nearby what do we mean by open source and identity and access manager obviously uh, securing your securing your software uh, you know, you you might have users' uh, identities that you want to protect. Uh, you might have access and access rights and resources, etc. Uh, you might even want to broker those identities uh, when it comes to things like, you know, you might have Azure um, AD, ADFS as an example or an LDAP store, and you might even store all your users over there. So connecting all of those different areas uh, together and then managing it kind of becomes, becomes very, very important. Um, and obviously, federating across them also becomes important. So stuff like that, that Keycloak really helps with. And we're going to get into detail, so don't, don't worry too much. I'll explain this even more. Um, Keycloak is a CNCF project. Uh, it has a bunch of client libraries. If you use Java, if you use Quarkus, which we're going to showcase today, 
uh, Spring, Node.js, et cetera, you should be able to use that. And in future, uh, if you're going to use standard you know, protocols, you'll also be able to use standard client connectors to, to work with Keycloak as well. So that's a quick introduction what Keycloak is. Uh, let's get into some more details about you know, what the Red Hat build of Keycloak is based out of today. Uh, so Keycloak has been there for almost like a decade, um, and, and it's been used a lot, like I said, uh, across multiple sort of uh, scenarios. Uh, obviously, the, the older Keycloak version uh, was based on the JBoss EAP. And JBoss EAP, if you know, is an application server, uh, a really well-lived application server, you know, serves a lot of applications, business, business critical applications across the globe. Um, but it is based on a monolithic pattern. And obviously, as we move into the cloud, monolithic pattern not always is the right fit. Doesn't mean it is not always not the fit, but it's not always the right fit either. Um, so, so there are some things that you, when you put into the cloud, you want to make aware of. For example, um, you know, you you want your solution to be uh, spinning up quickly. Uh, your, you want your solution to be uh, scalable across uh, multiple nodes. If things fail, then it's able to you know come back up again quickly and and restore from that. So all of that architecture sort of comes in with some sort of microservice mindset. Um, and Quarkus in that area and going towards serverless as an example as well helps you. So Quarkus in that area um, helps a lot. Quarkus you know, minimizes the time uh, it takes for an application to start up. It minimizes the, the memory that the application uses. And it also has the possibility to run applications in native mode as well. So it becomes an extremely interesting choice uh, when we're talking about resource consumption, when we're talking about workload density, and when we're talking about serverless applications as well. So, so Quarkus becomes a good choice for example, in this case, case Keycloak um, to base off um, its stack. I have some pictorials here on the right, which pretty much I said the same is, you know, traditional native stacks take a lot more. Um, Quarkus takes a lot less. And even when it's native, it takes even a lot lesser uh, time and as well as the memory that it operates with as well. What requires security? So. Uh, like the title of my talk today, I mean, it's 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 important that I also sort of make you aware of, or some of you aware of, uh, you know, why do we actually sort of care about security, or or what applications require security? Um, I've I've been in projects, uh, you know, where we have developed our own solution for security. Obviously, uh, full confession here, you know, I've been in the industry for more than twenty years, uh, developing and and you know solutions have not been sort of there that would actually centralize this. Uh, but then, obviously, one starts an application, might be a backend application or a web application, could be a desktop application, mobile applications, APIs, clouds, all of these, they have increased a lot more in the last couple of years. And obviously, it's not the same desktop application sort of thing that we used to live in, where you could get away with Kerberos or some sort of active directory behind it that you could secure your stuff with. Now you have multiple areas that you want to secure your applications with. So it kind of becomes trivial to start thinking, well, well how is it going? How is this going to work for us? Um, homegrown applications uh, or homegrown security mechanisms kind of is has been something that we are all very familiar of, or or me in this sense as well, uh, playing that that developer role. Um, when we do that, obviously, uh, we start thinking about putting our identities in a database, uh, you know, whether we sort of, let's say it's an MVC application, we create a user entity, we create, you know, a little bit of logic around putting all those credentials in a database or backed by an LDAP maybe, or even in these days actually use something external like um, an, an OAuth provider from one of the big uh, cloud providers like maybe Google or somebody else. And sort of do that, and that's that's sort of in a way okay. Uh, but then what we don't care about mostly is the type of algorithm we might be using in the self-grown application. We might have problems tracking this, and then obviously the if somebody did this uh, and then they left or or they moved to another project, then you have a problem tracking and trying to fix all of this non-standardized code and recipes that has been created over a period of time. This becomes a serious challenge even for auditing. And obviously, when we're looking at putting things online, um, you know, on the cloud, et cetera, hybrid cloud, 
uh, security becomes paramount importance and security sort of has to be standardized across all these applications. Um, and that's exactly what something like Keycloak key does. Um, you have you have a simple uh, centralized uh, server, which is, let's say, in this case, Red Hat build of Keycloak. Um, you have different um, services that, uh, that need to be uh, authenticated. They need to be verified. And then you have users that, that needs to use those applications um, and, and get themselves verified with Red Hat uh, build of Keycloak in this case. So you sort of come to a point where you start to say, OK, we maybe want to outsource that part that we have been cooking in ourselves in our applications to something that's external, whether we are writing our own tokens, et cetera. Um, and why is that helpful? We get, get into that in a bit as well. So assuming, let's say, um, you decide that, OK, we want to secure our services. Um, when you look at user stores, users all over will, or applications all over would be using different sort of user stores. Active Directory is one, LDAP is another. There could be custom user stores as well. So <clears throat> what Keycloak would be able to do is able to connect to those user stores um, and federate those users across them. And now, obviously, if I was to write an application for this myself, I can imagine how much um, complexity I would bring in just by connecting to different user stores and then managing them across you know, one centralized application. So Keycloak takes that complexity away from you um, and, and does the user federation for you as well. Also does the identity brokering. So let's say on top of that, you wanted to use a different sort of protocol. Uh, some of your applications might be using Kerberos. Some of your applications might want to use OpenID Connect or OAuth or SAML v2, et cetera. You're able to uh, work with that as well and, and uh, bring all the identity brokering into Keycloak as well. So it has its arm in that area as well, where still you're focusing on configuring and you know putting things in a Red Hat Builder of Keycloak rather than actually putting it together. And we have an example that I'm going to show you today as well. And then finally, social logins like GitHub or, or Google, et cetera, you're able to do that too. So you have that interface. So now think that you have an application um, that you just created. And all you need to do is, is basically use the Red Hat Builder of Keycloak and secure your application as a client, whereas put all the logic that's about security into your into Red Hat Build of Keycloak uh, and let it manage users and roles and, and identities, et cetera, from there as well. So it becomes really, really interesting um, proposition because now if you're multiplying your applications by, let's say, 10 or something, or even 20 or thousands, you're able to manage them uh, with a centralized uh, uh, piece of uh, software that, that basically handles this rather than you actually uh, managing multiple combinations of it across your uh, application estate as well. Then let's look at maybe <clears throat> in, 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 a, in a wider scenario, uh, you might have different things like we mentioned some of the ones like social login providers, LDAP, also SAML v2. So SAML is a, is a protocol for, for applications. It's you know, older applications that have used it. And then obviously you're able to integrate them and bring them into your application. And that's 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 the story you bring, whether you have the applications that were written many years ago or whether you have applications today, uh, using these protocols, you're able to connect them together. You're able to do all the auditing, monitoring and logging, et cetera, and make sure that the user experience is, is seamless with Red Hat Build of Keycloak. And in the demo, we're gonna see how that user experience works as well. So that was a quick, quick overview on um, what Keycloak is, right? I mean, I hope for users that uh, that have uh, that haven't used it, this is useful. And then we can move on to, for example, what does the Red Hat build of Keycloak uh, version 22 bring us? Um, so this is the release overview. Like I said, Keycloak has been there for 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 quite a long time, almost like a decade. The previous version of Red Hat single sign-on, um, the product, was based on Keycloak 19, which was based out of JBoss EAP. Uh, Keycloak 22 is based off um, uh, on a Quarkus uh, build. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a new distribution. Uh, it's it's friendlier for cloud environments, faster startup times, lower memory, um, <clears throat> smaller distribution size altogether, and and obviously reduce and constrain container images. So it's 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 really really looking at how efficiently we can you know bring it up. And when I show you in the demo, when we bring it up, you'll see that it's it's actually quite fast. And it works, um, and it works really nicely with uh, uh, with uh, with OpenShift or Kubernetes as well, if you would say like that. 
So what are the, the, the things that we bring in in Red Hat Build of Keycloak apart from, yes, it's performing, yes, it's re-architected, and that might not be so much uh, visible to, uh, to end users, but what's most visible to the end users is the user experience. Quarkus is known for its developer experience. Quarkus has a really good set of services uh, when it comes to uh, you know dev services, continuous testing. Uh, there's there's tons of things that that are really really good with Quarkus, and we'll show I'll show you that in the demo how we actually work together with uh, with Keycloak when we do that as well. So developer user experience is much much more different. How you create your container images, how you sort of add your functionality into Keycloak, all of that. Um, we're going to take a look at it today as well. The users, obviously, uh, from from a user perspective, you know, uh, looking at the accounts, looking at their uh, managed access, etc., all of those with a new user portal uh, that's out there, plus the administration experience, whether it's CLI, etc., uh, being able to define that as well. Uh, you know, uh, for example, when it comes to security, and I'm going to talk about this in, in a second. Um, uh, you're also able to have like a production profile, uh, a developer profile. So you do start dev, uh, you're able to use Keycloak on your local machine um, in, in a developer mode, you know, with HTTP and HTTPS uh, disabled as an example, making it easier for you. Uh, if you start it in a production mode, obviously the, uh, the full secure mode comes on and you get functionality for production in there as well. So there's there's features that we have looked into when it comes to how we make sure that the user experience for all different roles that use uh, Keycloak are, are also being able to use that, whether it's uh, on your physical machine or whether it's inside OpenShift uh, with the operator experience as well. So from a usability perspective, like I said, you know, simple, uh, you're using a kc.sh start um, and then you give it a database, which is Postgres in this case, and that's pretty much it. You can start it with a CLI. You can start with an environment variable. You can start with the uh, with a keycloak.conf that you can pass to, on to it as well. There's no longer a standalone.xml that was there before. Uh, so that's gone. Um, so, so that kind of helps you to sort of put your configuration in place uh, when you are starting the uh, the server. Um, and and that's, that's much, much more simpler than we have seen the previous um, Previous experience as well. The configuration is quite self-destructive, um, and there's there's the um, a, a lot of those environment variables that you can use there as well. Here again, if you look at it, you know, KC SA start. Uh, you put the Postgres a database there. You put in the URL host name, and this is obviously in a local machine that we're trying to uh, showcase here in the container image. It's per totally different, which I'll showcase to you in a bit as well. Um, but you don't need to think about installing drivers. Uh, everything is built in. Um, every time there are changes, there's re-augmentation as well. Um, so, so all of this is support coming from Quarkus directly, and Keycloak itself is an extension of Quarkus. So it sort of makes it much, much more simpler um, to, to, to work with as well. And these are all build-time optimizations. So when you put them in, um, then, then you have the entire stack uh, you know, taking the benefit of Quarkus, and it's ahead of time compilation as well. Um, from a security perspective, one of the big items is having the uh, FIP support, um, the Federal Information Processing Standard, which ensures that you know you have the right you know security guardrails into it, whether it's encryption, etc. So it supports the 142 uh, FIP standard with the with the Bouncy Castle libraries and and also the Sun PKCS 11 plus NSS as well, right? So you're able to create a more secure environment with Keycloak than what it already is. And what it already is, is that it's secured by default. You have a production mode, like I mentioned before, and you also have a developer mode. Uh, in the developer mode, HTTP is enabled, the strict host name resolution is disabled, and the whole setup is more developer friendly. Uh, whereas in the production mode, obviously, uh, there's, there's TLS requirement, there's host name requirements, and HTTP is disabled. This wasn't the case in previous releases, but from this release, obviously, this is um, uh, this is the case, and you sort of have the profiles that you can work with, uh, which makes it much, much more easier when you're developing or when you are uh, using it in production. So secure by default uh, for production in that case as well. Uh, <clears throat> when we look at observability, again, you know, the ability to take out metrics. So let's say um, you're using an OpenShift and you want to take the metrics out of the system or you have, you know, on your zip file, 
um, into your physical machine or in containers, you have the slash matrix endpoint um, that gives you um, the matrix from the system, uh, whether it's uh, you can set the matrix out from your database and you'll get them too. So all the different details around the caching mechanism that's being used under the hood uh, within Keycloak to ensure that all the sessions and all the caches are maintained uh, within, within a node, for example, if you are if you are clustering it, um, and and also the system level details as well. So so slash metrics sort of gives you the possibility as an example to work with Prometheus. So now you're able to have uh, you know metrics being scraped by Prometheus, um, as well as you know you can also have a Grafana dashboard that you might use in your operations. Um, to do that as well, or if you have any other system at home that you actually use with. Um, it also integrates with something like Creostat, and Creostat is, if you have heard about JFR, the Java Flight Recorder, uh, the Java Flight Recorder system, it takes away all the, uh, you know, the different JVM related uh, details like garbage collection, if there's any bottlenecks within the JVM, etc. It's able to take them out as well. So you are able to use Creostat within um, the, uh, together with OpenShift um, to actually get those details out of, um, um, out of the system as well. So some comprehensive things around observability as well. The health point, health endpoint is also something similar with the Quark is health extension. You're able to look at, you know, uh, the health of the system, whether it's up and running. So if you have systems that, uh, other automation system that have to react based on if uh, the health of the system is, is degraded or is not working, um, then polling this, these endpoints sort of helps as well. So you're able to uh, scrape that too. And by just providing the minus minus health dash enabled parameter equals to true on the command line, this would come up as well. The new operator, and this is something that I will showcase in the demo um, as well is, you know, it's, it's rewritten from scratch. If you're a Java developer and you want to write operators, I know Uth loves to have operators these days. He's working a lot on them. So uh, Uth, I hope you use Java Operator SDK. Um, so Java Operator SDK will help you as a Java developer to create operators with Java. Um, it is, in, 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 and that's what the Keycloak system is also using. Um, it makes it easy for us to uh, create, um, you know, production grade installations of Keycloak, uh, the Red Hat build of Keycloak, um, you know, in close alignment with the user experience, et cetera. And we'll see in the demo, like some of the things like we do, like the Realm import CR, uh, which is new this time is like you can take the entire Realm uh, and import it uh, once the server is up. And, and I'll also show that with some re-augmentation uh, when we go into that demo. So um, one of the big things, obviously, with the operator experience is supporting all the databases that we use. Um, in our demo, we're going to use the Postgres database. Um, but with the with the CRs, you're able to actually connect with the databases um, through the uh, through the operator experience as well. So some good good things, good nuggets um, that we use there as well. Uh, from the from the client adapters part, uh, we get into uh, you know like I mentioned earlier, Keycloak you know has the possibility to use OpenID Connect uh, or SAML, so you you have the possibility uh, for that obviously um, to use them. Um, you have the Node.js adapter, uh, is the client-side JavaScript adapter itself. Uh, in my app in Angular today, I'm going to use the Node.js um, adapter from, from the Angular Keycloak project. And obviously, if you're using MicroProfile, if you're using Quarkus, you'd use the OpenID Connect extension, um, and you're able to do that. One thing definitely that we're focusing on uh, going forward is, okay, thinking that um, applications and frameworks uh, frameworks mostly should be able to use the default, you know, standard connectors when it comes to OpenID Connect, um, and be able to work with Keycloak as well. So that's something that definitely that's on the cards uh, as we as we mature into this particular distribution uh, at this point as well. An important point I think I missed is um, that there's no more OIDC adapter for EAP8, but you know it's this native OIDC support. Uh, that comes from from the Wildfly uh, community as well, since the JBoss CAP8 is based on Wildfly. Um, so you'll be able to use that uh, going going forward as well. So some good stuff there. So awesome. So now let's just uh, move on to the um, towards the um, towards the demo. Uh, unless if there's any question, I could take a pause and take those questions uh, if that makes sense. I'm not sure. It's up to you. Um, 
Uh, no questions so far. Uh, I was just enjoying your comments on the Java operator stuff. <laughs> well, I, I just had to put that in for you. But OK. <laughs> um, over here, uh, what I've done is I have a Quarkus application. Uh, what I've simply done is I've went on to something like uh, code.quarkus. Uh, .io and obviously this is not a Quarkus demo, so I'm not I'm not going to try to go into these details. But I basically just generate an application after selecting a certain bunch of uh, you know extensions and and got my application up right. Um, so when I did that, obviously um, I'm I'm using something called a book service, and a book service has a title, a genere, an ISBN, and summary. Simple. Uh, you know, it takes um, that's my entity over here. So if you're familiar with Java code. Um, it's 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 a simple um, entity pojo that is a panache entity which is a simple way of creating um, entities uh, in Quarkus and you know sort of working with some of the methods like helper methods like here uh, get all etc where I don't need to you know sort of give all the details and there's good good there's positives and negatives to it but I think from a usability perspective very easy to work with um, and start to work with. Um, the other thing I have is the book resource, which has functions like get all, get one, create, update, delete. And obviously what I want to do is that first, I'm just going to show you how this is working. Um, next, I want to do is obviously secure them um, as, I, as I go forward. So I'll do this. I'm going to use my Java 17. Um, and I'm just going to start up what is called the Quarkus um, dev mode. And obviously, <clears throat> as, a, as a developer, if, depending on which framework you're using, um, this basically helps me to put Quarkus, what we call, into dev mode. Once we put it into dev mode, um, it will come in, come up as you see. Um, Quarkus knows that you know what kind of things am I using, in, underneath my, uh, you know, palm file, which extensions I'm using. It knows that it will know that I'm using Postgres. It knows I'm using OpenAPI, I'm using the OpenShift extension. So all of these extensions that I'm already using, Quarkus is well aware of it. Uh, what does that mean? That means that, let's say, if Quarkus has something called its Quarkus Developer Console, so I'm going to go there, um, and it's called on Q slash dev. Um, when I go on the Q slash dev, <clears throat> I can see, for example, uh, there's a bunch of extensions, and I hope this is clear. Let me just play it make it white yeah <clears throat> so all the extensions for example it knows that i'm using uh, uh hibernate it knows that i asked for an openshift extension uh, so i can actually go and deploy this uh, on an openshift server if i wanted to uh, but i'm not doing that right now um, it, it has all the different extensions that i have put in my project at this time but what's interesting it because it knows that i'm actually using hibernate in postgres uh, if I go into my developer services, it has actually started up an instance um, of Postgres for me already, uh, which has uh, which has uh, basically loaded my entire schema, my import.sql file into it as well, and I'm ready to develop. So over here, when I go back into my book resource, um, <clears throat> I'm able to, or, or if, even if I make a simple... Uh, change over here, Quarkus is able to do that very quickly and look at it. So if I go back here um, and try to hit my uh, URL again, it's gonna it's gonna crash, and and I didn't have to restart the server, restart the application, etc. So from a usability perspective, uh, Quarkus is quite smart. Uh, it understands uh, what's going on. It's able to kind of give me all the details. Um, um, that that I need working uh, with Quarkus as well, and obviously has the underlying in this case database, so I don't need to worry about spinning it up. It's a container. If I go on um, <clears throat> on my console here and just do a Docker ps, it's a test container integration which has spun up uh, a Postgres instance just like two minutes ago uh, for me as well. So that's pretty nice. I can do that. I have my API. Uh, if I go on to HTTPS, uh, call this as, so HTTP colon slash at localhost, um, <clears throat> and my endpoint is AD, API slash books, I'm able to see that, you know, my API is loading. So that's pretty much it. It's a simple thing. It has a bunch of books, um, title, generic, ISBN, summary, like we had over there, um, and it loads that in as well. So 
if I go back into my application and now I say, okay, um, Quark is, oh, well, I already have it. So let's just do that. <clears throat> Quark is extension at Quark is dash OIDC. Um, you'll see that the extension is added. And what Quark is, is doing is that it's already start to re-augment my server um, and it start to do something, which is start to pull the key cloak extension uh, into my development environment. So what's this gonna do is basically it starts a key cloak server uh, through the test container integration. Uh, and it says that Quarkus has started the um, uh, my, my, my key cloak instance. So if I go back on my, on my dev services console um, and I go back into this, I can see that, hey, key cloak is already up and running and that's awesome. Now I have my key cloak running and what does that mean for me? So if I go back to my extensions, I have the open ID connect extension um, and let's say if I go into my uh, admin, I can actually log in and start to work with my application and key cloak at the same time. Now it already has a default um, default realm for playing around with and it has this Quarkus app but what if I don't want to use that? I, I don't want I don't want this particular one to be used. I want my you know realm, my own realm that I might be working with uh, to be able to uh, to use this. So what I'll do in this case is I have already a Quarkus realm JSON file, and obviously I don't want to bore with you uh, bore you with this 20, uh, 2073 line code. I'm just going to say, okay, uncomment. And also what I want to do is I don't want a random port to come for my uh, Quarkus because, you know, I might have other applications I'm working with. So I want, I want a standard port for this as well. Um, so when I do this, obviously it's going to change. Um, and when I go back, let's go back. And now I'm really being bullish playing with ports here. Uh, let's see. And it's loading. And if I go back here, I can see that you know it's starting the key cloak server again. And this time when it starts, it's gonna use the configuration that I have provided uh, in this particular case. So obviously I go here, uh, I go to the key cloak admin, and obviously it didn't work. 8180 uh, administration admin and admin. I put that in. Uh, and go back to the Quarkus realm, and I'll see that now I don't have that Quarkus app, but I have my backend service. And my backend service is my book service that I'm working with. So now I can just start to develop with my book service on my local machine as well. Uh, so this is pretty cool. I mean, Keycloak is up and running, uh, and all I need to do is uh, I have my extension in. All I need to do is make sure that I have all my configuration set uh, and start to put in some code around this. Now, if I go back to my realm here, I have I have users, um, I have Alice. Um, Alice, uh, you know, is uh, part of uh, the role user, um, and then there's Joe uh, John Doe, which is which is from a different one. We'll see that one as well in a minute. So now, if I go back <clears throat> to my code and I have those users, and I say, okay, since Alice has the role user. Um, Actually, you know, what I'll do is I'm just going to paste this out here on the other uh, links as well. Um, and all these method functions that I am, like, for example, on create, I want it to be user. Obviously, I can change that um, on, on my function update. I want it to be authenticated as well. Um, and so these are the roles that I want to allow. And for, for now, I'm just going to use this one over here, but we can change this later as well. Um, so what I'm saying is that, hey, uh, make sure that only user, the, the role user is allowed um, to work with my service. So when I go back here and I go back to my uh, API endpoint, um, localhost, API, and uh, books was it. And obviously, it's not going to do anything because at this moment, everything has been authenticated um, and books. Oops. So, yeah. So, everything needs to be authenticated and it has to be done via key cloak. Now, obviously, this is a back end service. So, we are creating a back end service at this time, a new nice book service. Um, nothing happens. Uh, you know, it, um, it failed because it needs authentication, it needs, an, it's, it needs a specific token. 
So let's just go and um, get a token and see how that works for us. So if I do curl um, <clears throat> and localhost realm Squarkus, um, I'm going to get an access token, echo access token. I have my access token, so let's take a look at that, what that is. Uh, yep. So that breaks the token apart. We can see that I have a user, a role user, which is in this case Alice, because if I look at my command again, um, <clears throat> I am using the Alice, Alice as the username and password um, to, to get this token. So that's perfect. I have the user roles. Um, and I have some ad additional you know, things into it, but that's that's the token I need. So if I go back now and say, okay, I wanna curl my uh, get request <clears throat> with this access token, I should be able to get my uh, get my API you know, details as well. So that's how <clears throat> simplified it is um, to do this. Now, remember that I haven't really restarted anything here again. It just happens by itself. So again, if I wanna, come here and say, I want to change, I want to change the role now. And in this case, again, <clears throat> if I go back here um, and try uh, to get my API, I'm not going to be able to do that. It's 403 forbidden. So basically it's not allowing me um, to do this anymore. <clears throat> and because I've changed the role, and th in this case, it has to be a different user. So, so sort of kind of gives you that <clears throat> overview uh, of how this could be done. Now, obviously, I want to play a bit more, <laughs> um, and we're going to do this a little, a little bit differently. So now I move on to my Angular app. Sorry, need some water. Um, <clears throat> in the Angular app, obviously, um, in the key cloak, I'm using the Angular key cloak. Um, I have the um, key cloak Angular extension. I'm, I have the key cloak Angular module in my um, ang Angular modules, and I also have a key cloak service. I do a key cloak in it here, which is my localhost 1810. I have a couple of components, which is adding books, some book details, listing of the book. Um, I have the model similar to what I had in the, um, in the other application as well. And finally, I have a book service, which is basically just going to that API that we have and, and working with it. So the whole flow it's gonna be is, that what I want is that this application should use uh, my backend API that, have, that I have on this host right now. So before I do that, <clears throat> I'm going to go here uh, to my administration console. I'm going to go into my clients. I do not have a backend uh, uh, books front end client. So I'm going to create a books front end client, call it Brooks uh, front end um, for my Angular app. <clears throat> and I'm going to have. So simple authentication, no changes there. Uh, and the root URL is going to be localhost colon 4200. Um, that's, my, <clears throat> that's my app ng serve, for example, at this time as well. So that's done. And we have that clearly perfect. So this looks good. Um, save it one more time. I'm just being paranoid. But OK, let's be pretty paranoid. Um, and then I'm going to start my application with ng serve. Um, making sure that I have the right uh, URL for my key cloak, perfect. Um, and then I believe in my environments, I should have the right URL for the local host. Yes, I do. So ng serve <clears throat> will build this up, and and you know we'll be able to use this locally. And let's just quickly take a quick look how this actually works. Um, I'm gonna go up here, um, try on the browser, localhost 4200. And automatically, rather than going to my front end, you know, my Angular front end, it redirects me um, to the Quarkus realm, which has this particular uh, front end client that I put in. So if I say Alice and Alice again, um, I should be able to see the books, right? So perfect. I'm able to do that. I'm able to edit this. I'm going to make a mistake here. And Alice is <clears throat> making some mistakes, you know, um, just like a simple a user. Um, and and, and Quarkus has been renamed in 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 a, in, a, in sort of a, like a different way, S, -Quar S Quarkus. So we want to fix that, right? And we don't want these mistakes to to happen. So how are we going to work with that? So let's say we don't want all the users in 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 here 
to be able in our in our organization to do this. So what we're going to do is that I'm going to use my put method, which is my update method. I'm going to change this to confidential. Uh, save this, and obviously when I go back, um, refresh my app um, and try to edit. Which one is it? This one uh, cannot access this book. So it's not letting me access this book anymore. Um, and that's because I don't have the right user. So let's log out. And this time, I want to have a different user. And that's John Doe. Perfect name for a user, a confidential one. Um, <clears throat> and here, obviously, uh, I can change details and update as well. So here you can see the update is done. <clears throat> Sorry. And I can uh, just reload this. I can see that the verification is done. I can see my tokens are being assigned, um, all of these details. Obviously, also one of the things that you'll see is if you want to know all your details about what endpoints you can use, et cetera, you also are able to do that locally using the dot well-known uh, OpenID configuration as well. So all those details, in encryptions, et cetera, everything is available to you. So this is this is a nice way of developing applications. So it helps me uh, to work with it. But then, what about <clears throat> what about if I wanted to deploy this application? And there comes uh, the interesting piece, which is uh, in my case on on this side of the window. Uh, I think I'm just going to make it bigger. Is is using the um, the operators now? This is my OpenShift workspace. Um, my namespace is called RHBK. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to install a new operator, uh, which is called the Red Hat Build of Keycloak operator, which you will find on the operator hub. Um, I use that operator. It says it is the build 2206. Uh, I'm going to install it. And actually, before I do that, let's take a look again. <clears throat> it has it has certain features. It's able to do basic installation. It's able to do upgrades, full lifecycle, deep insight. So there's tons of things that you can do. Most importantly, it's able to install Keycloak in a namespace, and it can also import realms. And that's exactly what we're going to try to do right now. Uh, we're going to install this in an RHBK namespace, so we can install it in multiple namespaces if we wanted to. Uh, but this particular operator only installs in one namespace at a time. So we're going to do that, install it in our RHBK namespace. So while that's happening, obviously, the operator part is being provisioned. Uh, we're going to see it here. So it's going to come up. I can see the logs. Uh, you know, it starts to create itself, and this is again based on Quarkus. Comes up pretty nicely um, and quickly. So we are able to do that. But for it, for this to work, I also need some more details. So I'm just gonna cheat a bit here, and the cheating is because I do not remember all the YAML uh, by heart. So I'm just gonna bring in my README file, um, which sort of has some <clears throat> some YAML for me. What I need to do, obviously, uh, is to is to create um, is to create my um, my my database. I want to create a database in the back end, uh, and this is a Postgres database I use with Crunchy as an example, um, and I'm able to do that. So let's do that, creating the database, uh, and you can see that it's going <clears> to <throat> come up. A Crunchy database uh, will come up as well. What I can then do is. <clears throat> which I've already done. Um, I create an open SSL certificate. So basically saying um, in my subject, <clears throat> I'm going to put in, for example, uh, my CN, uh, which is pretty much, if I look here, is the Keycloak RHBK app. So it's if you look at it, it's the RHBK project I have. And then it's the route which actually it serves on. Uh, so what I want to do is obviously I want to make sure that my system is secured and and like I said in production it's default secured and I don't want to disable uh, HTTP so I need to generate these files uh, they are generated uh, again <laughs> and and what I'm going to do next is I'm going to load this into my into 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 OpenShift as well um, to uh, create a TLS um, certificate uh, into it as well. So here's, for example, my secret, which will have my certificate and my key file um, as well. So let's just create that. Actually, I hope I'm in the right project. I should check that first, OC project. Yes, I'm in the right project. So um, 
Always make sure to be in the right project. I've made that mistake many times. Um, <clears throat> TLS, uh, we do that, load that in. So if I go into, for example, secrets here um, with my RHPK project, I will see that my ex example TLS secret has been loaded. Um, <clears throat> what I also want to do is create a secret for my database uh, that needs it needs to connect to. Uh, and we're going to do that too. So a generic database secret that I also push in here. So now I have two secrets that I that I want to do. And next, what I want to do after that is basically um, create my uh, create my uh, instance uh, for Keycloak using the operator. To do that, I have a host name. Obviously, the host name binding has to be correct. In this case, it has to be the correct place that I am uh, pointing to. So I'm going to copy this one just like I did for my certificate. Um, put it here. Uh, example TLS uh, secret is there. I have my DB secret to connect to my database. I think this looks good. Let's hope so. So Keycloak will start, you know, if I look at my operator, it has already started begin, beginning the provisioning of this Keycloak instance. It comes up pretty fast. If I look at it, you know, logs wise, there you go. It's up already. And uh, that's that's quite amazing. Uh, what I do want to do is get my, um, when this is created, obviously um, it's going to get, um, I need to get the secret, which is the example KC initial admin secret, which is my admin username and pass, uh, admin password, because that is what my um, operator would create by default. So if I go here onto the operator, obviously this is a self-signed certificate. Proceed anyways. <clears throat> go to the administration console. And here I am able to log in uh, as the admin. So now you have the same thing. You don't have the Quarkus realm here, right? Um, that was something that we had in our local environment. Um, so obviously we want to make sure that we are able to load that. And with this new operator, we can we can do that as well. Uh, so let's do that and then let's get into some more details. And obviously for that, um, I would I have obviously created that file. Um, that I would use. Uh, let me just get it. One second. Uh, because I have to, in this case, this was a JSON file that I used with my uh, single sign on, and I converted my Keycloak JSON um, realm file into a YAML file, which you should be able to do with you know simple um, uh, converters as well. So, what's it doing? It's the same 2000 plus lines code. But it's also saying, hey, this is my realm. Import this, the ID, and the name of the realm is Quarkus. So I create this, and then it's going to start to create it. But if I go back here and I look quickly, that there is there's something happening is that the, the realm Quarkus is being created, and it's going to be loaded uh, within this a specific um, instance as well, which has reinitialized itself as the realm is loading. So this is pretty interesting. It sort of re-augments itself, the server, and starts to reinitialize the server with the new realm and all the settings. This means that if I wanted to add extensions or custom code, et cetera, in the future, I would be able to do something similar um, to that as well. So let's go back. I think I will need re-authentication. Uh, if, I, if I do anything here, we probably do that. <clears throat> yes, administration call. So. Um, and then I need to get my password again. And I'm able to do that. Um, <clears throat> and now if I look at it, I have the Quarkus realm as well. I have the clients. It's the same realm I used on the local. I just converted it um, to use over here. I have my backend service. Uh, I will need a new service that I need to put in, which is my Angular service. I have the same users that I needed. So let's quickly go um, and deploy this application um, into my in, into OpenShift as well. To do that, I have already done some pre-configuration. I have the Quarkus OIDC auth server URL. So this is my this is my auth server URL that I just created. 
Um, the backend service is my client ID in this case that I work with. Um, and then obviously I have a secret, which is super secret called secret. Um, I'd say it's a service, but also because I have a self-signed certificate, I don't want to do the verification. Otherwise the server is going to fail. So all of that is up in place. Uh, what obviously I want to do before I put my app up is uh, I want to install my um, Postgres database because that's where my data is going to live. Um, and I do that quickly uh, as well. And my Postgres database should start coming up. If I go back here, yes, it's coming up as a books database. Perfect. Now all I want to do is I want to deploy this Quarkus app um, into uh, into my machine as well, into OpenShift as well. And with, with, the, with the Quarkus, I can do that through my command line by providing the deploy functionality with the OpenShift extension that I'm already using. Um, there's different strategies you could use. I'm in this case using the OpenShift uh, S2I. You could also use the Docker build strategy, et cetera. But what it, it's going to do is it's going to just go in there into my um, OpenShift environment, and it's going to start a build. Uh, and here you see the book service build is going on. Um, it will start, and then it's going to uh, push my uh, book service into um, into an image that it's going to be used by uh, by OpenShift as well. Uh, let's do this as well quickly. That uh, while I do that, I'm also going to deploy the um, the Angular app. And to do that uh, again, I can use the um, the OpenShift as well. I'm just going to change my uh, server URL here um, for 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 Keycloak. Um, I need to do an ng build uh, to build this um, so that it has the right right things in it. Um, and I think my Quarkus service is taking time. Okay, it's there. So it should come up. There you go. It comes up right now. Uh, the book service, it it won't get you know directly working right now because I will need a token, but we can check that uh, quite quickly. Uh, the Quarkus service is up. Uh, I have a specific URL. So if I go back to my um, to doing my curl command here, um, <clears throat> and in my current command, I am going to simply change my URL. In this case, oops, no, not that one. No, 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 no. Hang on. Too many copy paste can happen. So let's take it here. Control C and Control V. We have that now. And I should be able to get my token. Echo access token. We have our new token. Perfect. Um, now, obviously, I want to curl this and check that I am able to do that as well. Um, Yeah, that should work. And there you go. So, so we have our token working. We have our application working. All we need to do now uh, is deploy this front end. So I'm just going to create a new, a new app, uh, sorry, new build, which uses HTTPD and OpenShift. So it's basically using the S2I image again for, for Angular. Um, and then OC start build is going to start this build. It's going to take all this code from my local machine, and it's going to push it uh, into the, um, the OpenShift environment as well. Next, I will do is I'll take this container image, um, and I'm going to create the application, uh, which I should be able to do quite quickly, uh, and expose it. And then we will have our fully functioning app with the front end and back end uh, as we do. So OK. New app, um, do this. That should create the new app. And then OC expose should expose my URL. So if I go back here, I should see my bookshelf UI. I click on it, and it should redirect me to the key cloak. And it doesn't. And guess why? Why it doesn't? <laughs> um, uh, it is because I have not set up my client yet. So let's do that quickly. Uh, create the client, uh, client ID, um, books, 
front end, next, next, and root URL, same thing, save. And if I am doing it right, this should be the moment. Yes. So now I have Alice and Alice as a password, and I can log in. So I see the books. I can edit them. I probably cannot edit them. Um, <clears throat> yep. Yeah, and because I am not the right user, um, oops. Um, <clears throat> so I'll log out. Uh, some problems there, obviously, like demos. Um, and I'm going to log in as not and be able to do that as well. So now I can edit my uh, books, uh, not the best way to edit, able to do that, etc. able to add all of those through the different roles that we saw. Obviously, with the new front end, the administrative console as well, there's some nice features. If you're looking at client ID, you know, you want to know what that is. It gives you some details around that too. Um, it has the options, uh, more options with run settings as an example. It's more, you know, divided, but plus more importantly, it has these nice tweaks where you can actually go into, uh, okay, I, I need to know how these groups work and what I need to do, it's able to go into those guides um, as well. And I can see I'm only left with four minutes. So I'm gonna pause here and and I did not see your screen. I did not see any questions coming up. So Uth and Isa, you can you can keep me honest here. So there aren't any questions in the chat as yet. I've got, I've got a question if you don't mind. Um, in terms of the databases that we support as the, the backend for Keycloak, um, do we support any databases on the cloud vendors? as first-class um, database? Uh, you mean uh, databases like Aurora, et cetera? Uh, like the Azure database for Postgres SQL and the, the Amazon, Amazon RDS for Postgres SQL. Are those mm -hmm. uh, supported as part of the, the, the build currently, or is it limited to things like Crunchy, Postgres? Yeah, I, I think the standard databases that we supported with single sign-on are pretty similar. Um, to that, so so even if it's Oracle, you'll be able to do that. So there's a list of them. I guess Isa, maybe you might know exactly. Um, yeah, which I, ones? If there are any cloud vendor databases that we support. Yeah, I can I can take that one. Basically, we support we do not support those cloud managed uh, databases because uh, there are a lot of them, and we struggle to have a team capacity uh, to be able to test those uh, because we can officially support them. Uh, as long as we, we have conducted some tests and make sure we are happy with the test results and they work perfectly fine with, uh, with the product. So, so far as of today, we support these five databases. Uh, they are on-prem databases, but uh, let me share a knowledge base article that may help. Uh, we are going to support Aurora uh, PostgreSQL compatibility and uh, uh, um, uh, RDS uh, PostgreSQL. So for commercial uh, uh, reasonable support, and we plan to officially support this in the upcoming uh, release update of uh, Red Hat Key Club. So to uh, simply put, they are not officially supported, but a customer, they can raise uh, support exceptions if they don't have any other options uh, than using Zeus and we will see what uh, what can be done but officially we can't claim support of this until we haven't tested so okay yeah. cool i'm not seeing any other questions in the chat um do you guys want to say something to finish before we close it down uh have you got sort of any urls we can share in terms of landing pages or uh, project pages yeah uh, so, sorry go ahead Isa. Yeah, landing pages I can share. It's, uh, let me put it on the chat. So it's this one for the product page. It has links to the download uh, page. It has links to all the documentations. Um, and yeah, the, the, the knowledge base articles, uh, error tasks that we published and links to how to get engaged with support so how we can open a support case uh call call out uh Red Hat support so 
Okay, sounds yeah. good. Um, I say we've hit. Uh, I say we've hit the hour. Uh, thanks for that, guys. That was a, a really cool demo. Uh, I do like watching Keith Hogan action. Um, and the demo girls were were pretty pretty nice to you. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. <laughs> for so a change. Yeah. So yeah, thanks. running on a remote cluster is never an easy thing, you know. So. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I've I've had too many clusters go down in the middle of my demos. Um, <laughs> but that was brilliant. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Thanks for putting up with the problems we have with the stream. Uh, we'll sort it out for the next time. And if that's the case, uh, I'll say goodbye. Cheers, all. Thank you.